بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ڈیئر پارٹیسپنٹس ویلکم ٹو دس تھرڈ سیریز ان دی ٹاپک دیٹ وی آر کنٹینوئنگ فار دا پاسٹ ٹو ویکس وچ از دی اسلامک شریا آف پریچنگ ٹوڈے ہوپ فلی ان شاء اللہ ول کمپلیٹ دس ٹاپک یو ووڈ بی ریمبرنگ دیٹ ایز فار ایز دا پریچنگ ریسپانسبلٹی از کنسرن ان دا لاسٹ ٹو سیشنز وی سو دیٹ دس پریچنگ ریسپانسبلٹی از امپوزڈ آن پیپل ریگارڈنگ دیئر اون ریسپانسبلٹیز اینڈ دیئر اون in their own capacity. It's not the same for all individuals. So we have seen how this preaching responsibility varies with prophets of God to children of Abraham and of course to scholars. Uh, there are two other categories that we will discuss today which would complete uh, this, these categories and then we'll uh, go on to study the style of preaching which has also been touched upon by the Quran. So the two categories that we are going to touch today relate to Uh, the Sharia responsibility of preaching upon rulers and, of course, on the common man, which might perhaps be the widest of all these categories. So the most important thing in this regard, uh, just to repeat, is that we must always realize that the faith that we all profess in uh, certain realities from God, as well as the righteous deeds that we are all required to do, the Almighty wants us to spread all these good teachings, uh, all these things that we believe in, and also uh, be a devout exponent of the good deeds that we do. And this can be done when we, in our own capacity as individuals, are able to spread this light, to shine this light on others as well. So needless to say that these responsibilities, or this responsibility, I would say, of preaching uh, is an all-important responsibility. It is essential for our own salvation uh, as well. So as far as uh, the preaching responsibility of uh, the rulers is concerned, uh, you will see that the basic verse is being displayed before you on the screen. This is verse 104 of Surah Ali Imran, which tells us that there has to be a group among us, amongst us who should be responsible for calling people towards the truth and forbidding them from evil. So we have people who would be doing this at the helm of the affairs. Uh, of course, uh, this could be, would be done not only through urging people, but also at times by implementing what right and wrong are, uh, especially what stopping people from doing wrong. So as far as exhorting people is concerned, this is something uh, for which the pulpit of the Friday prayer has been provided to the rulers. So on the Friday sermon, when they would be delivering this Friday sermon, they'll have all the chance of uh, delivering what religion is. Uh, regarding the common masses and if there is any uh, any departure or deviation and that needs to be checked by force then of course we have the police department for that that is precisely the duty uh, of the department to check any such deviation so the quranic words are waltakum minkum ummatun yad'una ila al-khair wa ya'muruna bil ma'ruf wa yanhawna 'anil munkar wa ulaika humul muflihun and there should be some people among you deputed to call towards righteousness, enjoining good and forbidding evil, and only those who make this arrangement shall achieve salvation. Now, as far as the responsibility itself is concerned, this is mentioned in Surah Hajj in the words, الَّذِينَ إِمْ مَكَّنَّاهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ أَقَامُ الصَّلَاةِ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةِ وَأَمَرُوا بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَنَهَوْا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَلِلَّهِ آقِبَةِ So, uh, this, this is something uh, that we have to also adhere to and As far as this verse is concerned, you'll find that uh, it has four responsibilities uh, clearly spelled out and that is that they have to be diligent in the prayer, they have to pay zakat, they have to enjoin what is virtuous and forbid what is evil. So as far as the state authorities are concerned, they can check every evil with force if uh, need be and of course they have to be prudent in this matter that all things that have to be checked uh, should also first be checked through Uh, exhortation through education and in certain areas where force is required, of course, uh, then force would be used. But then, of course, this is also something that we have to prudently do. But before that, you know, the two important responsibilities which uh, this verse mentions is that the system of prayer or namaz or, or, or a salah, as the Quran says, has to be implemented at the state level, which means that the Friday sermon would be delivered by the head of the state and Uh, his governors and deputies will do it in their provincial capitals or other administrative units. This is the responsibility of uh, the state 
and this responsibility uh, was uh, of course carried out by a prophet himself and after him by the rightly guided caliphate in which the rulers were required to come to the public uh, by delivering the Friday sermon, by talking to them, by presenting themselves for accountability and at the same time they were also responsible to uh, collect zakat which is of course a, the only tax which can be imposed on its, the Muslim citizens of a state uh, which is basically uh, a tax which is paid to the state in order for the state machinery to run in an efficient way. It's not just a poor or a charity tax which is uh, understood to be so generally. On the other hand, it's basically uh, money given by the citizens to run the state and the state machinery of course is run through it. Uh, it includes all sorts of uh, public works which have to be done by the state including education and health and other important facilities which are to be provided from this collected money. So these two important responsibilities rest on the rulers and as such they have to understand that if they have been given the helm of affairs, they are in charge of authority, then they in all their capacity must be people who should lead the Friday prayer and give the Friday sermon and at the same time they must also realize that this is an opportunity to, for them to come to their masses, to the common man and of course uh, interact with them. Now let's move on to the next which is the next category of preaching which is the preaching of the common individual, of the common man, of a person. Uh, who is neither, uh, who does not fall into the first four categories. So for this the Quran has used uh, the words that I'm just going to read out. This is verse 71 of uh, Surah number 9. It says, وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ And believers, both men and women, are friends to one another. They urge one another to what is good and forbid what is evil. And precisely this is mentioned in Surah Asr, uh, which is now being displayed on your screen and most of us would be memorizing the Surah as well. So the words are, Wal Asr inna linsana lafi khusr illa lazina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasaw bil haq wa tawasaw bil sabr. Time bears witness that these people shall definitely be in a state of loss. Yes, except those who accepted faith and did righteous deeds and exhorted one another to the truth and exhorted one another to remain steadfast on it. So this is the responsibility of a common person. This is the responsibility of a common man that in his own environment he must urge what is maruf, what is good and he must also try his best to check or curb any evil which is found uh, around him, of course, this is uh, something which relates to his own circle of authority. Wherever he has that authority, he can use that authority by force, but on all other occasions, it has to be just exhortation. Now, as far as uh, uh, the belief is concerned that uh, believers have to forbid what is uh, evil and urge what is good or what is right or what is the maruf, we have to understand that the word maruf in the Quran actually refers to uh, what is universally acknowledged to be good as far as other areas are concerned which of course relate to religious good then the word maruf does not encompass that. Uh, that is something which is encompassed by the very next verse uh, which I just quoted which is in Surah Asr. It says tawasaw bil haq which means everything which is truth including religion has to be preached by the person in his own circle. Uh, which of course also means that he need not go to great lengths to people from all parts of the society of uh, the, the place that he lives in. It has to be in his surroundings and this deduction is, is made by the words tawa, tawasa, which is uh, in Arabic means something which is to be done mutually and no one is going to stand out, no one is going to be the preacher as such, preacher designate. The person who is going to do so is going to be any, a common person. He would be doing so to maybe his own surroundings. So sometimes the father would be doing to the mother, the mother to the father, the son to the husband uh, of his wife or, and vice versa. So I mean this would be everything that, was, that would go on in the immediate surroundings of people. There would be no person so to speak who is going to be in a position which is an elevated position in which he or she is going to say that, well, I'm going to teach this to you. No, this is not the case here. It's a case of disseminating whatever 
truths you find in your in your own surroundings including those universal truths including those religious realities that all of us have been required to uphold and the best way to do so is through one's own character so the good and the right and what is correct in our eyes if it is to be delivered to people if it is to be disseminated to people then the best way to do this is through our own character through our own person so that we are able to make the best out of it and of course this is going to have the most impact on people as well and our hadith literature also speaks of this when it says that kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyatihi uh, which means that of course uh, that all of us have been deputed to a family we have been deputed to our herd so to speak so every person is a shepherd to his herd meaning that people who are Uh, under your influence under your circle of influence they have to be uh, you will be held accountable for those people uh, for whom you are made responsible of and in this regard the important thing is that one must not be misled by a narrative or misunderstand the narrative uh, which i am just going to read out before you this is from the muslim uh, al jamia sahih imam muslim and it says man ra minkum munkaran fal yughayyirhu bi yadi fa in lam yastati fa bi lisani fa in lam yastati fa bi qalbi wa zalika az'afu al iman which means that when any person among you sees an evil in a circle of authority he should try to curb it by the force of his hands if he does not have the faith to do it he should try to curb it by his tongue and if even this is not possible he should consider it bad in his heart and this is the lowest level of faith so remember the important words here are circle of authority no one has the authority to exceed these bounds and maybe cross over to someone's house or maybe go and cause destruction to anything in the society which he or she might think is against religion or the norms of decency this is not the case the, the hadith specifically tells us that anything which is in our circle of authority which is in our own uh, circle of influence if we see something which is bad we can do it by force and this is the best thing that that we need to do and the next best thing is that if we are not able to curb it uh, then we should try to curb it by the tongue if we, if we cannot curb it, curb it by the hand then we have to do it by the tongue which means that at least we should tell people that they are doing something wrong and if this is uh, something which is not possible because of weakness in faith then remember this is what the, Quran, uh, the hadith tells us is the weakest level of faith that you are neither able to curb it from your hands nor able to speak against it but the only thing that you can do is regard it to be evil or bad in your own heart so this narrative has often been misinterpreted it has been generalized and people think that this is an absolute directive that wherever a person sees evil he can just go and have a go at it and stop it uh, well that is not the case the the uh, person who, who has been designated here and the word illam yastate here doesn't refer to uh, is it actually refers to a person's faith the 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 strength of faith the strongest person would be the one who was able to curb this evil in his own circle of authority so the circle of authority is the important thing and if you recall i just cited a narrative before you which said kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyatihi this is from al bukhari which means that each one of you is a shepherd and each person will be held accountable for his herd not for the herd of others so we are responsible for people who are under our circle of influence so it is very important to understand because uh, there are many muslims who have unfortunately misunderstood this narrative and they think that it's it has a general application meaning that uh, they can go and Uh, do uh, I mean they can do do can police other people they can stop other people by force and implement their own decision uh, of righteousness on them this is not the case uh, as I said it has to be related to one's own authority the, the prophet himself is uh, is uh, is said I mean he's told in 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 very uh, in very uh, clear terms that in nama anta muzakir lasta alayhim bi musaytir your duty is only to remind people Uh, to remind them and not to use force on them so basically that uh, something that we have to understand is that whatever we think right is something that we should try to be uh, exponents of we should of course be uh, delivering the good and the right that we think other people should follow we should implement it on our own selves we should be its biggest exponents 
And when we see something wrong, of course, the first step would be to exhort people to make them realize what this wrong uh, would lead them to. And in our own circle of influence, the, the highest faith or the highest stature of faith would be that you curb this evil by force. But if you have a weaker faith, then as the Hadith has just spelled out, uh, you'll be held accountable I mean, for what you could have done by your hand and you ended up doing by your tongue or ultimately, as the Hadith says, that you could not even do it by your tongue and you ended up doing it in your heart. So this is the responsibility of the common man and Surah Asr, which we just read out earlier, is the surah which tells us about this responsibility that uh, the essential requirements of salvation in the hereafter have been spelled out in this surah that you have to profess faith. Amanu wa amilu salihat means that you have to be, do righteous deeds. And then tawasaw bil haq. You have to mutually exhort one another to the truth, to what right is, to what the correct uh, point of view is. And tawasaw bil sabr then once you adopt this righteousness, of obviously trials and tribulations will come your way. They'll afflict you. And for this, you have to persevere. You have to show patience. And therefore, the ultimate thing as the, as the verse ends on is that that you should mutually exhort one another to perseverance on this truth that you have adopted. So, folks, this is something that we needed to know as far as the preaching responsibility is concerned vis-a-vis -vis, uh, various categories. Uh, the categories that we have studied today relate to the rulers of an Islamic state and then, of course, to the common man. Prior to these two categories, we also studied three other categories earlier on. The first was the preaching responsibility of the prophets of God. Then we saw that there is another category which is called the preaching responsibility of the progeny of Abraham. So the progeny of Abraham, the children of Abraham, his descendants, they have a very special role to play in this matter as well. And the third category that we studied uh, last week was the preaching responsibility which is imposed on scholars of religion. And today we have studied these two responsibilities and these two categories as well, which brings us uh, to an end to these five categories which are very important to realize and we need to understand and place ourselves in these categories and at the same time fulfill our obligations regarding uh, these categories. Uh, lastly, now we'll study another important fact and chapter from within the Quran, uh, which the Quran has very, very uh, specially, I would say, focused on so that Preaching itself should become a dynamic thing. It should become something in which you are involved from your mind, from your heart, from your soul. You use your wisdom, you use your intellect and at the same time always think that this preaching that you are responsible of is not to be done and dispensed with it at, uh, at the time that you feel appropriate. The time, the appropriate time is not the time that when we are feeling to do something and we just go about doing it. The appropriate time, of course, is when the other person to whom we would require the truths to be conveyed to is in a position to listen to us, is in a position to be a person who could lend his or her ears to this preaching. So the Quran is actually very, very, as I said, importantly focused on this aspect. And uh, this brings us to the fifth and final chapter, I would say, or the topic or heading we would be studying as far as the uh, as, as far as the responsibility is concerned. In fact, it's the sixth topic. We have already uh, covered five topics. So the sixth topic is basically uh, something which relates to the strategy of preaching. It relates to the, uh, to the plan and, and the way that we should go about in preaching uh, that is presented. So the Quranic verse that has been displayed before you is the basic and primary verse in this regard. Uh, I'm just going to read out this verse. It says, Ud'u ila sabili rabbik. Call men to the path of your Lord with wisdom and kindly exhortation and debate with them in the most befitting manner. Indeed, your Lord best knows those who stray from his path and those who are rightly guided. And if you avenge, let this be commensurate with the wrong that has been inflicted upon you. 
And if you exercise patience, then this is the best way for the patient. So as you can see, this kindly exhortation, uh, which is mentioned uh, in, this, in this verse is something that we need to understand and which is the basis of our delivery, which is the basis of dissemination and preaching that as far as calling people to the path of God is concerned, it has to be with wisdom, with sagacity, with, with kindly exhortation, which means that you have that concern for the person. It's not that you'd like to knock him out or just uh, make him understand that he's going astray. But the more important thing is that you would like him or her to come back to the path of righteousness by expressing your concern in a way that moves the person's heart. It really stirs the soul of that person. And instead of being regarded as, as a person who is an outcast or a person who has been just, who, 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 who does not need any, uh, any sympathy, uh, it's the very opposite, that the, that is the person who needs the sympathy the most. He or she is the person for whom our, our doors from the heart should be open. We should be welcoming such a person. In, instead of shying away from that person, instead of thinking that, well, he's no good for us or he's no good for religion, the more the person goes away, the closer we should try to come to him or her and try to make the person realize how important it is to come close to God. So this is an aspect which has been explained in detail by, by the Quran uh, regarding the fact that as far as this kindly exhortation is concerned and this wisdom is concerned, what is, thing, what is the thing that is most important? But as far as this verse is concerned, you'll see that uh, wisdom, kindly exhortation and sound discussion, these are the three things uh, which the verse mentions. I'm just going to display the verse once again, once again before you. So in Arabic, it says al-hikmah, which means wisdom, al-mu'izat al-hasana, which means kindly exhortation, and mujadila, which means discussion and debate, and how you can uh, move along with the other person by, by interacting with that person. So these are the three things which have been discussed uh, in, this, uh, in this verse. Secondly, the responsibility of a preacher is that of preaching only. The communication and elucidation of the truth that he is required to do is something uh, that he should understand is all that he or she needs to do. As far as guidance itself is concerned, the Quran has made it amply clear that this is something which only God can provide. You just cannot guide or forcibly guide people or make them understand. Your job is to disseminate, to, to, to deliver the truth. As far as acceptance is concerned, this would be between that person and, and, and God because God has his own law of, of gui providing guidance. Unless the person has that need and urge to be guided, God is not going to guide that person. And so therefore, uh, even the prophet was, was bidden when he showed his anxiousness for people to accept faith. Look what the Quran has told the prophet. إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءَ Remember, this is the Prophet being addressed, not a common person. And which should make us clear how, how important it is that even the Prophet is not able to guide people who are not able to have the urge to be guided. So it says, you cannot guide whomsoever you please. It is God who guides according to his law whom he pleases and he best knows those who are guided. And something very similar is mentioned right below. This is Surah, uh, Surah Rad in verse 4. It says, uh, Once again, the Prophet is addressed and said that it is you who have to deliver. Your responsibility is to disseminate, is to communicate, and it is for us to take your account. So you cannot drive people to the truth. You can just deliver the truth. As far as being acceptors of the truth is concerned, the Almighty says this is a law that he is going to govern through his own uh, his, through his own. Uh, principles, which of course the primary being that unless the, a person has this urge to accept guidance, God is not going to provide that person with guidance. You have to show the thirst towards that guidance. The third important thing which this verse actually mentions is that the addresses of preaching, if they resort to oppression and inflict harm on, on the preacher, he is allowed to avenge uh, in equal terms. So remember, let me just uh, redisplay that verse. It says that for in aqabtum fa aqibu bi mislima uqabtum bihi. So it says that if and if you avenge, let this be commensurate with the wrong that has been inflicted upon you. 
ولا ان صبرتم له خير للصابرين so the third important thing which is mentioned here is that during the course of preaching if people are wrong if people are hurt then they can i mean when i say people of course referring to the preacher himself then the quran says that the preacher has the authority he has been given this leverage to take uh, the revenge of on equal footing but it should not be beyond that but then the quran says wala in sabartum lahu wa khairun lis sabirin if you show patience and perseverance and do not take revenge and just forgo that person forgive that person then this is best for people who are patient so this verse as you can see it lays out a complete strategy of preaching before us it tells us how important it is that in our life we have to understand that conveying the truth is something which is our responsibility but it has to be done with a method it has to be done with a certain strategy which this verse spells out now some of the important thing which have to be understood regarding this hikma in mauzat and mauzat al hasana which means wisdom and kindly exhortation has been uh, spelled out they have been spelled out by ustaz javed al ghamidi in his uh, preaching sharia the, the book uh, that the the chapter itself that we are studying he has shown how some of the strategy points which have been reflected in this verse of surah nahl have been discussed in the quran in more detail So the first thing that uh, he has pointed out is that as far as wisdom and sagacity is concerned and our own prowess of uh, delivering the truth is concerned the first and foremost thing is that we must consider the intellectual ability of our addressees uh, people whom we address they have to be addressed according to their own capacities according to their own intellect and it's not that everything has to be told to them at once uh, without any gradual process being involved and the quranic verse which he has cited here is absolutely appropriate it is it says that wa quran an farqnahu li taqra'u ala an-nas ala muksin wa nazzalnahu tanzila and we have revealed the quran piecemeal so that you may gradually recite it to people and we have diligently revealed it so you see the important thing here is that the almighty has taken his own time 22 years for the quran to be revealed it was revealed gradually it could have been revealed in one go but elsewhere in the quran we are told that had the quran been revealed in one go people would not have been able to digest it in one go we as individuals we are always used to certain traditions certain prior ideologies and for them to change it has to be a gradual process so the almighty keeping due consideration or giving due consideration to human psyche to our own nature he revealed the quran and his directives in a piecemeal way gradually in installments so that people could digest and absorb uh, partly and then they would go on and one of the beautiful things which uh, prophet has in- explained in this regard is something that you would also be very uh, I mean, very fulfilling i mean it would be a sense of fulfillment on your part to see how uh, aisha radhiya taala anha has uh, explained this uh, regarding the uh, piecemeal instruction of the quran she has said that the first thing to be revealed in the quran was a surah from among the mufassal which mentions paradise and hell until when people entered the folds of islam then directives regarding prohibition and allowance were revealed and in reality now this is important If the directive refrain from drinking liquor had been revealed earlier on people would have said we will never refrain from alcohol and if the directive do not commit fornication had been revealed people would have said we will never refrain from fornication so remember there were two evils which were found in the arab society one of these evils was alcohol and the other which is a natural consequence of alcohol was adultery or fornication and Uh, what the point which is being made here is uh, that the uh, that Aisha Ali Taala and her mother of the faithful has said that first of all broad directives were given people were exhorted towards the truth they were told what was hell and the details of hell and heaven were expounded to them so that they would have this initiative to go towards paradise and uh, it was later on when the prohibition or the prohibitive directives were revealed it was not that at the very start. that people were told to give up alcohol or to give up fornication it it came later signifying the fact that as people get used to uh, new directives the the things that they are very used to the things which are they they find uh, becoming their second nature they are only done away with once they get used to it 
So had the prohibition of alcohol or fornication been the first directive, people would have shown aversion to it because they were so used to it. So the point here once again is that the Quran itself and the Almighty of course and the Prophet, they understood this human psyche, this, this part of ourselves that we would gradually give up things that we have become so used to. Now the second important thing are psychological considerations. And just as intellectual considerations are important, psychological considerations are equally important. And these have a number of aspects and they have been expounded by Ustaz in his book also. So the first thing that he has said is that whatever aspect of religion we presented before people should be presented in a manner that you feel comfortable with it. You don't feel any loathing towards it. And he has cited this beautiful, these beautiful words from the Prophet. He says, Bashiru wala tunafiru that give glad tidings to people and don't spread hatred among them. Which actually means that you as individuals and we as individuals, we should always take the initiative in spreading the positive points towards people and inspiring them. Instead of, instead of uh, making them scared of directives, our job should be to make them understand that as far as we are concerned, as far as uh, our own uh, responsibility is concerned, it is something that has to be done in a way that we should be presenting religion in a very amicable way, in a very friendly way, in a way that we are able to understand that as far as our own personality is concerned, if we start frightening people, if we start scaring people fr uh, from uh, the wrath of God, then people are going to just shy away, they are going to be scared and instead of loving God, instead of being attached to God, they will end up uh, being scared of him, not in the manner that you're scared of a person that you love, but in a manner that you are scared of a person with whom you are overawed. So this is one important area. The second thing that he has mentioned here is that a preacher should not criticize the beliefs and cherished personalities of his adversaries. This is of course something which is very, very common, that as far as we are concerned, uh, we must not criticize the cherished personalities of people who are in front of us or who, to whom we are going to preach. Otherwise, they are going to feel the brunt of it. They are going to reply back in, on equal footing. And precisely for this, as you can see, the Quran has said, And do not revile those which they invoke besides God, lest in their ignorance they revile God with the rancor. Which of course means that if you start criticizing the people in a, in a way that is not going to sit well with them, they are going to come back and start reviling God and, and call names upon God, which of course is not uh, at all befitting. So the important thing is that as far as presenting truths is concerned, you should do so in a manner that does not touch upon their personalities especially and you don't use disrespectful words for them because if you use disrespectful words for personalities who are dear to our addresses then they are going to do the same for our own personalities. The third important thing which uh, the Quran has mentioned re regarding psychological considerations is that a preacher should specially take into fact uh, into account the fact that the leaders and chiefs among the adversaries of a preacher always want themselves to be respected. This is something that we have already uh, discussed in the, in the previous point. So uh, the, the way that you have to speak to such people uh, not only is, not, is that you should not revile them or show disrespect to them, the Quran in fact tells us that you have to speak to them softly. So you see when Moses and Aaron were sent towards the Pharaoh, look what he was asked or they were asked uh, to do in order to speak to the, to the Pharaoh and his, and his courtiers. He said that, speak to them with gentle words and that he may take heed of Pharaoh's Lord. So the words are, فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنًا فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنًا which means that you have to speak them in a soft way. We speak to them in a soft way, in a gentle way, in a way that it does not uh, tell upon their self-esteem or their ego does not get hurt because if their ego is going to get hurt then this is something which is not going to be in any way helpful in making them understand what reality is. Now important thing is that at times the addressees are in a mood of, they are not in a mood of raising objections. I mean they are in, 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 a, in a position that they are, they would not like to listen to you. Uh, they have 
taken up to jeering. They may be people who are going to uh, make fun of you or do things which are absolutely unbecoming of them. So in such cases, the Almighty says, when you see people, they are engrossed in a way that they are going to make fun of you or they are going to make fun of my revelations. Then instead of sitting uh, with them, this honor for the truth, this honor for God's revelations within us should make us just leave that place politely and just leave that uh, area in which people are make, f making fun of God's revelations until the time they are able to do something else. So this is very important. And the Quran says, And when you see those who scoff at our revelations, withdraw from them till they engage in other talk. And should Satan cause you to forget this, do not sit with the wrongdoers as soon as you remember. So at times we don't remember that people are making fun of God's revelations and we are still sitting with them. So the Almighty says that as soon as you remember that this is being done, just leave that place because one should also have a sense of honor for the truth and uh, for what uh, righteousness is. The fifth important uh, aspect of psychological considerations is that uh, a preacher should abstain from presenting his manner in an unconcerned and mechanical way. It should be in a way that you feel concerned for the individual. It should be in a way that you are able to connect to that, to that person. And for this, uh, we can see how uh, Ustaz has cited uh, Imam Bukhari's, uh, one of the narratives from Imam Bukhari. So it is said that a person, uh, that it is narrated by Abu Wail that Ibn Masood would instruct, Abu Wail is, is a student of Ibn Masood, that Ibn Masood would instruct and remind people about religion every Thursday. A person from among them said, Oh Abu Abdullah, Abu, Oh Abu Abdul Rahman, I want you to remind us every day. He replied, I don't do this lest it may be burdensome on you. I remind you at intervals the way the Prophet used to remind us at intervals lest we, become, we may become fed up. So you see, the most important thing is not to be repetitive, not to be doing all these things in a way that every time you see a person who is your adversary, you start that lesson over and over again. It's just going to uh, be something which is very dismissive on his part. He's going to dismiss whatever we are going to say. So there has to be some semblance of interval that must be inserted. We must give the other person the time, the space, the opportunity to think about what we have told them. And every time we meet them, it should not be the case that we think that, well, here comes a person whom we can just vent out our emotions of love and preaching, uh, whatever the situation is. No, that is, would not be correct. So it has to be understood that preaching as well as talking to people regarding the truth, it should be something which should always be in a gradual way. It should be intermittent. It should be interspaced. People should be given that breathing space so that they are able to reflect on the message that we have delivered to them. And then again, uh, one of the important aspects which the Quran has told us vis-a-vis -vis the uh, anecdote of uh, Prophet Joseph when he was sent to prison is to wait for the opportune moments. You have to wait for these opportune moments in order to deliver the truth. If you are going to do so without realizing the, whether the other person is in a position to accept whatever we are going to tell him or her, then this is something that would not be right on our part. We might think that we are discharging our duty, but the fact is it would be burdensome. It would be cumbersome on the person who is receiving it. So we have to wait for that opportune moment. And this has been beautifully depicted in Prophet Joseph's anecdote when he, was, when he entered the prison and when he saw that the, the two other inmates of uh, prison were attentive, and attentive to him vis-a-vis uh, -vis the interpretation of a dream that they, has, they had seen, he immediately saw this a chance to deliver them the truth, to make them realize that we must not believe in multiple gods. So you see, he took this opportunity when they, 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 they began trusting him, then they began uh, relying on him, and they began being impressed by his prowess to interpret dreams, that he would use this opportunity to convey the truth to them. So this is an example which is, which is very befitting as well as very, very uh, important and significant in our own uh, circle of guidance that the right time to deliver, deliver the truth, the right time to talk to people is very essential. Uh, and then preaching has to be done, uh, something which the Quran has often said, starting with what is common between us and our adversary. And this has been demonstrated in the Quran very, very beautifully in the, uh, in the verses in which 
we uh, Muslims were said that when they talk to the people of the book, start with what is common between them. And what was common between them was the belief of Tawheed, it was the belief of monotheism, which meant that the believers and the non-believers or the believers and the people of the book, all of them, they were people or individuals who, who would be in a position that they would always come in a, in a, in a way that basically the common points will be discussed. So the Quran says, ila kalimatin sawa in bainana wa bainakum, which means that they are individuals who would be calling people to what they believe, to what is common. So you see, this is human psyche. When you do something which is already accepted between you and your adversary, you feel that comfort, you feel that adjustment, you feel that you and the other person, they gel together. So if you start off with common points, and next you move towards points which are of difference, you will realize that it is easy to talk about these differences and it is easy to communicate to our adversaries some of the things that might not be easy at all to communicate had we started with these differences. So the Quran has given us this cue to start off uh, talking to our adversaries with things or about things which are common between us and our adversaries. And then uh, one important psychological consideration is that uh, if instead of responding to the arguments of a preacher through arguments that we have presented before him, if our adversary resorts to foul play, then instead of answering that person in, in a similar way, a preacher should just back away and deliver, deliver his method in a, in a very different tone, in a, in, through another angle, which should make his or her adversary realize the fact that, well, uh, it's not always, uh, it, all, it is not always about answering the person in what he or she is presenting. At times, you just change the scenario and that can really work. And this is beautifully presented in Abraham's uh, debate and discussion with Nimrod. So the Quran says that, uh, have you not seen the person who argued with Abraham about his Lord merely because God had bestowed sovereignty upon him when Abraham said to him, my Lord is the one who gives life and death. Now, this is what Nimrod said. My, my God is, I mean, I... This is this is some this is this is a, a given between two pe people who are now interacting regarding the supreme deity. So he said, uh, I mean, when Abraham said to that to Nimrod, he said that my God gives life and death. Look what he replied. He said, uh, I have this power. I mean, it's not that you God gives life and death. I give this. So one thing would have been that Abraham would have gone forward and made a remark and argued with them and said, well, no, this is not correct. It is my God who gives life and death. But Abraham, he took another, his, his own discussion, this, it took another turn. It, it totally uh, came, I mean, he came from another angle and he said that, look, my God takes the sun out of the east. Now you, if you have the power, why don't you go and take the sun out of the west, from the west? And the Quran says, which means the person, uh, the Nimrod himself, he was aghast, he was astounded. He had no answer. So you see, the, the, the guidance which is provided right here is that at times, instead of entangling ourselves with our adversary in a way that you, you are interlocked with the debate, when the time comes for that, you just change the scenario and come from another angle and present your, uh, your whole case or premised in a way that the other person has no answer to. So these are the points which regard the psychological considerations of preaching to be of utmost importance. Now a third important thing which is also part of this wisdom and kindly exhortation is the style of preaching, the style adopted. And this style uh, is beautifully once again reflected in the, in the supplication of Moses uh, when when Moses uh, was given the responsibility of, to, to speak to the Pharaoh, he, he prayed to God and he said, God, make my task easy for me and liberate my tongue from its impediment. Uh, this, of course, is something which Moses had requested God. He said that I'm not a very powerful speaker. I'm not a sermonizer. Please give me the power that, so that I can conquer hearts and vanquish souls. So to be a person who addresses the hearts of people and their minds in a way which is moving, in a way that you can convince them, that is, that is required from this style of preaching. And as a consequence, there are certain things that we have to understand. First of all, the preaching should be free from any ambiguity. It should be absolutely clear, something which 
which begins with the heart and it ends with the heart. So the Quran has said that as far as the Quran is concerned, it was revealed to the heart of the Almighty. And it says, وَإِنَّهُ لَتَنزِيلُ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّحُ الْأَمِينَ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ لِتَكُونَ مِنِ الْمُنزِرِينَ So, and surely this is revealed by the Lord of the universe with diligence and meticulousness. The faithful spirit has brought it down into your heart that you may give warning in an eloquent Arabic tongue. So see, that eloquence, that lucidity, that clarity is something that, ha that is the hallmark of preachers. They don't entangle themselves or they interlock themselves in ambiguous details. They have that clarity. They have that, uh, that eloquence which touches a person's mind and his soul and his heart. And then as uh, the Quran has also said that the style adopted should always have that variety in itself. The same thing can be taught to people in different styles. And the Quran has said that وَكَذَلِكَ نُسَخْرِفُ الْآيَاتِ وَلِيَقُولُوا دَرَسْتَ لِنُبَيِّنَنَّهُ لِكَوْمِ يَعْلَمُونَ And in this way, we present our arguments in various ways so that they are left with no excuse to deny them and that they may say, you have thoroughly recited out to us and that we may explain for those who want to know. So you see, Adding variety, adding flavor, adding color, and using various similes, various metaphors, various scenarios to your own advantage is essential because human beings, they, they tend to take monotony in a way that they are not going to be moved with that. So if that mon mon monotony is replaced by variety, by various other forms, it becomes really effective. And then the discourse of a preacher should not merely be ex exemplary in the arguments and reasoning it furnishes. It should be vibrant with fervor and enthusiasm, which means that the way you present it, it should not be just plain reasoning. I mean, it's not just be empty reasoning. It should have the vibrancy, the force behind it, that zeal, that enthusiasm. And it is said that when the prophet used to present his, his case or his uh, arguments before people, at times his face would get red. And people would see as if a person who is, who is really, uh, I mean, into something, he is very concerned with the outcome. He's really concerned about the consequences. He really, he's really, he's really thinks about uh, what his people are going to face if they don't accept what the truth is. He will become more enthusiastic. He will become more connected to their hearts. So the style should not just be intellectual, which of course is a requirement. You need to under make people understand through reasoning but it should also have that vibrancy. It should have that beat about it, that rhythm, that things which, which also stirs the emotions of people, which is also very important. And then besides this enthusiasm and vivacity and vigor in presenting arguments, a preacher should never resort to polemical debate. I mean, if you start these polemical debates in which you start discussing polemics in a way that is going to, uh, I mean, just prolong the discussion, this is not anything which is going to be worthwhile. And finally, the, the, a preacher must always uh, stick, to the, uh, stick to his objective. And I mean, it's not that he should go right and left, cite folk tales or history or things that are unrelated. You, a preacher must always adopt a style in which he remains focused. And the best example of this focused preaching is the Quran itself. If you read the Quran, you find how focused it is to our addresses, how clearly it goes from one to another point or to a third point or maybe to a fourth point. But in all these points, it addresses people in a way that it remains focused on the basic objective. It never compromises on that basic objective. So after the style of preaching, uh, some of the other things that we can see are also mentioned vis-a-vis -vis the style is that the, the data which the prophets of God base their preaching on is absolutely simple, natural and pure. Uh, embedded in the message of the prophet is not mere reasoning but also cues and prompts. And then they neither base their arguments on wrong views of their addresses nor on their irrational notions but they present their, uh, their case in a positive way. And they, they never retaliate with similar objections on the ideology of their addressees. This is something which is very common that instead of uh, coming up with, with counter uh, objections, they present their own message in a, in a very, very positive way. Their reasoning initiates from commonly accepted realities and slowly progresses to what are different between the two. What is different between the two? So again, that commonality aspect, that aspect in which you start with those points in which the style always accommodates the other person 
is something that has to be understood. And finally, we have to make uh, us understand that as far as the methods of preaching are concerned, uh, this again is something also that we have to understand that as people who would like to present the truth, we should take hold of every and all sorts of things that could be uh, that could be affected, effective. In the times of the Prophet, of course, uh, it was teaching, it was preaching, it was discussion. Today, if we come, uh, have we come a long way from that period, we have so many other instruments at our disposal. We have the social media, we have the internet, we have so many other uh, forums. So the, the thing is that as far as the methods of preaching are concerned, they must always be absolutely commensurate, absolutely in line with the time that we are living in. Uh, at times, a lecture of one hour or so, <laughs> something which is just going to bore off your, uh, your audience is not the right way to do so. Uh, it's always the right thing that you take into use modern techniques, modern means of communication, because this is something that has to be always understood. So, immoral, so some of the things that we have to understand regarding these methods of preaching have been touched upon by Ustaz Ahmadi and he has made a short list of them. He says that immoral and unethical methods should not be adopted whatsoever in preaching. So, the method have, I mean, whatever methods you adopt should not reflect immorality or vulgarity or something which is unethical. It has to conform, our preaching has to conform to certain moral standards and methods which damage the honor or preaching of preaching or that of the preacher also must not be accepted. So, we have to have that honor, that, that self-esteem, the, 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 the connection and honor that we have for, for our affiliation towards the truth uh, must also be there. And then methods of preaching should not be adopted which damage the objective of preaching. So at times we indulge into nitpicking, at times into uh, hair splitting, we indulge into polemical debates as we just uh, discussed. These are needless uh, things that we do because they are not going to make the message more palpable, more digestible. It's just going to uh, create that acrimony between the two. And so, uh, these are some of the areas that, uh, the, that our preaching or style of preaching must always adopt. So, just to sum up, we have to understand that as far as preaching is concerned, it should take, take into account the psychological aspect, the intellectual aspect, the style of reasoning is very important, the methods of reasoning, they are all important. Uh, so, the opportune moments that we have to conduct our preaching has to be also taken into account. So, in short, Preaching is a skill, it's an art, it's an art that we need to, uh, to learn and it's not just something that we need to dispense with whenever we think that the time has come for us to, to disseminate religion. As I said, this, these are guidelines which have been laid down by the Quran and uh, this whole preaching sharia, the way it has been explained by Ustaz Yawid Ghamidi in his book Mizan uh, is something that calls for our attention as people who are actively involved in delivering the truth, in disseminating the truth, in connecting ourselves to the society, that we must always think about this whole endeavor as an art, as a skill that we must learn and then dispense with it as against the fact that we should do it in a raw way. So this brings us to an end to this uh, topic as well, the Sharia of preaching. Inshallah, next time we will uh, come up with another topic from the book Mizan and until then it is Khuda Hafiz. Thank you very much Dr. Salim. Um, to start off with the Q&A but before we get to that I just wanted to say thank you so much for this lecture because I feel like a lot of these points that you discussed are the same points that I learned throughout and how to give a great talk so thank you so much. Uh, our first question in the chat asks is this also applicable to WhatsApp groups, this kind of guidance, where conversations, if a participant starts ridiculing Islam, one should simply stop responding to them or move on or away from the topic? Yes, it does. I mean, yes, when you see that people start to ridicule you, they start to make fun of you. Uh, I mean, common sense tells us that this is not the right time to continue with that person. And on such occasions, it is best to just withdraw just to ignore that happening as if nothing had happened and wait for the right time. You see, it is most important to realize that it's not that we have to make the, that decision. It's the decision that has to be made by the situation, by the scene itself, in which the person to whom you have to deliver the truth is in a position 
that he or she is now totally, I mean, has lent his or her ears towards you. I mean, when a person has a heart which has melted because of some situation, maybe the loss of a relative or some other happening, that is the time in which you can converse with that person heart to heart. But for example, when a person is busy with something or when he's angry or when he is in a retaliatory mode or in a, in a reaction, that is the worst time to convey one's thoughts. Uh, and so therefore, for this, it has to be patience and patience that we have to always uh, adopt. And with that patience comes that wisdom that we would ab be able to give that, uh, take that right decision when the time has come to speak. Thank you, Dr. Salim. The second question asks, are all these guidelines of da'wah and hikmah and mu'ziyah that we're studying, are these only applicable to career preachers and the common Muslims, are they not required to follow this path and these guidelines? No, it's, it's for all of us, not just for career preachers. It is for every single person who in some capacity or the other is an exponent of the truth or the righteousness that he or she stands about. I mean, all of us, we have to adopt these measures. Of course, the intensity uh, would be different for different people and the consequences of not adhering to these would also be different uh, regarding the capacities that we hold. But in general, these guidelines of preaching have been given for all these five categories that we have, we have just discussed. Thank you. MP Naveed Arfan, you're up next. Please go ahead. जी बहुत-बहुत शुक्रिया आपने जो ये चीजें बयान करी बहुत काफी ये चीज मुझे सीखने को मिली इसमें मुझे सवाल दो तीन उठे हैं मेरे मन में एक तो ये है कि जब हम किसी से डिस्कशन करेंगे तो क्या ये मेरी जिम्मेदारी है मतलब मुझ पे फर्ज है कि मैं किसी तक पहुंचाऊं और क्या सिर्फ मैं कुरान दे दूंगा तो भी ये काम हो सकता है और तीसरा ये कि कितने लेवल तक मुझे मतलब किसी तक पहुंचाना जिसे हुज्जत तमाम तक so you see, first we have to understand that it, as far as uh, itmamul hujja or conclusive communication is concerned, this is something that we can never do. This is the something which only prophets of God can do because they are doing so on behalf of God. All that we can do is to provide that opportunity for the person to to understand and to uh, be able to grasp the message. So our responsibility is to to keep doing so in our circle of influence, the people that we know, our friends, our relatives, our colleagues, our uh, siblings, people who are under our circle of influence. So basically for a common person, he or she does not need to go to, uh, to other parts of the world or to other cities. Uh, it's, it's the circle of influence that he or she has in which this responsibility has to be discharged. And it has to be discharged, as I said, in a way that you are just presenting what the truth is without thinking that you are now in a position to communicate it conclusively because this is just uh, what prophets of God can do. And the means that you can adopt are different. Yes, you can give the Quran as a text to be read. Uh, you can maybe talk about something uh, if the situation arises. Uh, you can maybe give a book of Hadith. You can maybe uh, point to a certain incident of a Sahabi. So all these things can be adopted. But if you, uh, if you ask the Quran, I would say, I mean, all these are supplementary, but the primary thing which the Quran has said is Zakir bil Quran, man yakhafu wa'id, that if you have to uh, preach people, if you have to remind people, then the Quran says, do it through the Quran. Zakir bil Quran, man yakhafu wa'id, that you uh, remind people through the Quran itself. So, so the best uh, vehicle or the best weapon, I would say, for preaching is the Quran itself. And the Quran could be used in various ways. I mean, you can partly discuss some surah. Maybe you can give the whole of the Quran to someone. Maybe a person would need a, a tafsir for a particular part. So the Quran could be utilized in different ways. But the primary way that we should go about reminding people is through the Quran itself. Thank you very much, Dr. Salim. Noshad Shafkat, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, excellent lecture, absolutely amazing. Uh, I was only uh, thinking about uh, the recent uh, unfortunate incident of uh, church burning that we witnessed in Pakistan a few days ago. And uh, contrasted with that, uh, when you quoted Surah Taha, that uh, even when God asked uh, Moses and Aaron to go to uh, the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh. And, and speak with him softly. 
Uh, mm. How would you suggest we go about, uh, you know, uh, um, educating our people uh, to that their God and our God, God is the same. We are creatures, creatures of the same God. They are also, they also believe in the unity of God. Of course, right. uh, it's been changed that into the Trinity, but still. It is very saddening to see that in spite of the brilliant, absolutely mind-boggling principles that you just enunciated, the psychological points, how could we go about uh, you know, making this clear to the common people? Thank you very much. I think uh, these points are already clear in our minds. What has clogged our minds is the erroneous concept of blasphemy or desecration, which has made people violent and mad. I mean, all of them in, in general, in normal circumstances, realize that uh, the Abrahamic God is the same. Uh, we believe in Tawheed. They also believe in Tawheed, albeit in a different way. Uh, there are so many other things that we have in common. But the thing is that what has really, really uh, played badly upon us, or have really uh, been horrible, is how we have implemented the blasphemy law in our country, the way it is invoked for personal vendettas, the way... Uh, our uh, sense of honor is ignited when we see that there is something has happened. So I think uh, not only should we educate people that as far as desecrating the Quran or maybe uh, doing things which are, I mean, not uh, worthwhile or not worthy of, of any book of God. So aside from that, uh, whether it is done uh, with the Quran or with the Bible or with any other book of God, we have seen the Quran burning in, or the Bible burning in Sweden recently as well. The thing is that all these, uh, I mean, these uh, rare personalities, I would say, or these books, they are far beyond any such reaction. We should not ask people to respect our Quran by, by being violent. I mean, people have a right to differ as well. People have a right to present their own opinion. Yes, they should not be disrespectful. But the thing is that 99% will find that this is disrespect is not, never there. It's either a difference of opinion or it's an overblown sense of emotion on the part of the Muslims. So the, the most important thing is that first, such incidents, I mean, they should, I mean, if ever is a person who is going to desecrate the Quran, which I would say is not even the case in this, in this matter that you just pointed to. But let us suppose there was some amount of desecration or sacrilege of the Quran uh, being involved. The, the best thing in that case would have been to completely ignore such a situation and just just pay no heed to it because you see if people are doing it out of the, their own ignorance it's going to die with that ignorance if it is something that is going to uh, take any i mean any any root in the, in the heart then it is the reasoning aspect that has to be understood if if you are if they are objecting on the quran on the basis of some something which is mentioned in the quran then instead of getting reactionary the best part would be to explain to them how uh, we would we think otherwise or the fact is that maybe they have misunderstood. So I think this whole process of uh, showing reaction is the pro is is a, is like a person who is weak and insecure as as a as a collectivity. So we think that if someone's uh, I mean uh, points to the Quran or the, to the personality of the Prophet, then it actually weakens that personality or it, it shows disrespect to the book. Well, yes, it does. But then this is something which, is, which they do for themselves. Uh, and this does not belittle the Quran or the Prophet in any way. It only belittles the person who does so. But in this particular case, this was not even the case. I mean, any sort of uh, blasphemy, if you read the details, was not even there. It was more of a misinformation that was being spread. So aside from the fact whether it was actually there or not, I mean, uh, in this case, it was not there at all. But for example, if it is, if there is something like that, again, uh, as I said, uh, I would refer to Abul Kalam Azad, one of the luminaries of our subcontinent, uh, and to some of the other new luminaries as well, who think that ignoring such incidents in which there is some sacrilege is best, and in, and to go behind what exactly is the reason of that. Uh, emotional outburst on the part of the critic is the right thing. So, for example, uh, if you would remember many years ago uh, in Denmark, we had this cartoon controversy. This is about 10 or 15 years ago when this erupted and the blasphemy law was f first taken into, I mean, international consideration. Uh, people were actually objecting to certain directives of the Quran, uh, of the uh, Prophet or the, some conduct of the Prophet. For example, his marriage with Aisha Ritala Anha was depicted in some of those cartoons in a very evil way, in a very, 
uh, I mean, if something was very mockingly shown, derogatorily shown. So I think uh, when you see that these are the things that are bothering the Western mind or for, for that matter, any mind, then I mean, instead of getting irritated, the right thing would be to find out the reason for that and maybe have a discussion or at least if that is not possible, then present the right opinion in that regard so that if there is any miscommunication or misunderstanding, that stands cleared. So why should we act as a bunch of reactionaries? Why not people who are mature? Why not people who take into account that there is always a room for difference of opinion? And if, if people are differing with you, they have the right to differ. Yes, they should ad adhere to certain norms, but then at times difference of opinion makes us uh, emotional as well. So I, I have given you more of a general answer. Of course, it doesn't uh, directly apply to the Jarawala incident because in that incident, as I said, I mean, it was absolutely uncalled for whatever was done by the mob, the way they desecrated churches, the way they, uh, they burnt and torched houses. Uh, and there were thousands of people left totally unsheltered and they're still in a position that they need the help of the government. The state writ was not implemented. Uh, this is absolutely a case of uh, lack of law and order in the society. Uh, in which minorities have to be protected. So remember the Prophet himself and the Quran himself itself has, has made it clear that as far as uh, our covenant with, is concerned, it has to be honored in all costs. And our, our, the, the minorities are living in, under that covenant of protection. And if that protection is violated, it should, it should really be uh, a cause of tremendous concern that the protection that was to be given to minorities on the state level was so badly violated and uh, we do hope that justice is served uh, which seldom is in our in our country but we do hope that something is done in, and at least that rehabilitation process of the churches and the houses which, which were torched and burnt is, is immediately uh, put into effect and uh, we can only pray that this does not happen because this is not the first time that such incidents have happened. This has happened so many times that churches have been torched, uh, minorities uh, rights have been flouted. And uh, the mindset, of course, uh, is to be blamed. And that mindset has a lot to do with our scholars, with people who are sitting on uh, the pulpits and uh, they, they deliver their sermons and they create hate in the minds of uh, people who listen to them. And uh, last but not the least, as I said, the blasphemy law, the way it is invoked and the way it has been implemented and the way uh, scholars generally use it uh, uh, to their, I mean, I would say the way they would use it or misuse it is something that needs to be rectified. Thank you, Dr. Salim. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. We have three more chat questions and not much time, so let's try to get through what we can. Um, the first one asks, I understand the concept of tablighi jamaat is not aligned with these principles of Islam, where common people start traveling to other areas uh, and countries for dawah. And what should be our responsibility when they show up at our home inviting us to do the same? Well, I mean, this is a uh, strategy that we can adopt regarding our own circumstances. I mean, there are people who are sincere. There are people who are really concerned. Yes, we don't agree with their strategy and the way they go about doing this. But of course, there are people who are calling us towards God. So maybe a polite refusal. Uh, you can spend some time listening to whatever they have to say if you have the time. Or maybe just tell them that you're not in a position, you're busy. Or, as I said, just polite refusal because what they do is that uh, they first come to your door, they knock at your door, they, they talk to you for a few minutes and then they invite you to a nearby mosque and they say that, well, we will have a detailed discussion. So, uh, and, and many of them, they insist that you come along with them at that right at that time. So, I think considering the fact that the, the intention and sincerity is very much pure, uh, the thing is that you need to tackle with, to tackle a very I mean, tackle them with very politeness, a lot of gentleness and, and, and let them know that, well, thank you very much for your concern and uh, I'll see what I can do best. So it's like a polite refusal or a polite evasion. Thank you, Dr. Slim. The next question asks, a scholar or student of knowledge should wait for the opportunity to share their truth. How should we behave when there's opportunity as the talk is going on, but people don't want us to share part of our knowledge about that talk? Well, we should, we should abstain. You see, if, if, the, if the talk is going about that, uh, the topic that you refer to, but people not, are not in a position or they are not willing to hear to you, that is signal enough for us to understand that we should not open our mouths because people are not in a position to or not in a mood to listen to us. 
And remember the Quran has said at one, and, uh, one place by addressing the Prophet, Zakir in Naf'at is Zikra. Remind people if you think that reminding is going to be beneficial. So if a person is not even in a mood to listen to us, uh, I mean, this is reason enough not to present or open our mouths. As I said, it is important. It's not just important to see that whether the time has come to uh, open our mouths and give our argument. Uh, more important is that if that argument or that uh, thing that you're going to say is going to be received by, the, by people who are there in the right frame of mind and they are in a position to accept your reasoning. So if it is not the case, then I mean, it's, it's always better to stay quiet. Thank you. Next question asks, sometimes a person feels lethargic in performing religious duties, for example, skipping Fajr prayer, just because of feeling sluggish. If a student of knowledge happens to do so, is he or she required the same as God said in Surah Al-Baqarah, why do you preach that which you, can, which you don't do yourself? Well, it does happen that at times we do not conform to the standards that we would like people to adopt. But then we are, we, are, we are all weak people. So if we are not uh, being able to do something because of a certain, maybe a mood issue or maybe, uh, I mean, it could be a temporary phase, that doesn't mean that we should stop uh, preaching uh, as well. I mean, we should work on both these issues at the same time. On the one hand, we should try to rectify anything that is going on amiss. For example, if we are uh, not being regular in our Fajr prayer, we should try our best. But that doesn't mean that we should stop people or stop urging people to do the Fajr prayer. Uh, at best, what you can say is that, uh, I mean, instead of using, I mean, instead of being on a higher pedestal and urging other people, the the uh, the style that can be adopted is we. And instead of saying you, you say we. And when you say we, you say, well, we should do this and we should do that, not that you should do that. So that would be like a advice and a counsel to our own selves as well. So I think it's just a question of thinking that uh, we are addressees to the preaching that we are doing to others, ourselves as well. So we are addressing ourselves and we are addressing other people as well. But if you are somehow falling short, then this should not make us shy away. In fact, this should make us even more uh, enthusiastic to try to rectify what we are not being able to do. Then that was it for all of the questions today. Thank you so much, Dr. Sleem, for another amazing session. And inshallah, see you tomorrow at Textual Studies of the Quran and next week.